you. Guys, no pressure, but probably your boss is around. <laughs> hey, Marco, are you here? Uh, no? Rather, nice. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to, to be here, uh, a few, but the good ones, right? Uh, and uh, thank you to all the organization to invite us to have the possibility to talk a little bit about the, the game design. Mm -hmm. uh, today we are going to present you some pillars that we, we follow to, to try to, to merge the game design and the, the web tree and uh, making good games, good products that are valuable and uh, entertaining, basically, is that. Good. So let's start off by saying we are game designers, like this said. Although we did not start with the Web3 gaming blockchain concept, we did study it enough at least to do that. And yeah, I dread could be guys. <laughs> Both of us graduated in game design courses, right? So we know this stuff, the traditional stuff, and that's what we focus on, gameplay, on having fun with traditional gaming and how we can incorporate that into actual Web3 games. So these are uh, our table of contents. Uh, we firstly going to start to talk a little bit about game design and then merge both concepts, the, the Web3, and uh, uh, present you our pillars uh, one by one and uh, show you how we make those games. <laughs> yep. But first, let's talk a bit backwards. So. Why do we play, right? There's a number of answers to this question. We can do it in order to socialize with other people. We can also do it to immerse ourselves in another world, live other experiences we can't have right now, or to challenge ourselves. But the key here is the word experience. Because what a game designer is, essentially, is somebody that creates the game's experience, right? If we could transmit the experience directly to your brain, that's what we would do. We can't, so we use games. When confronted to the idea to use the blockchain technology and uh, merge it to game design and try to create games uh, with that idea, e as we said, we are from the game design background, so we need to, to make some study about it. And uh, we noticed some disadvantage and some advantage that we can, can talk with that technology. Mm -hmm. uh, First, the, the bad news, the disadvantage. Uh, yeah, we, as we know, the, all the freedom uh, that comes as an advantage uh, brings some um, price volatility. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can't um, secure and uh, make all the rules in order to, to take the freedom to the, the client to the users, and uh, this can be some tricky uh, situation to, to get around. And uh, all regulations and uh, jurisdictions uh, side of it, uh, it's not easy to, and it's a little bit uncertain um, at the time. But on the other side, we have all the transparency, all the security, and all the, the privacy on the technology, and uh, that's uh, what we seek to, to bring value to our games. Yeah. So on, the, on the Web3 gaming side, we uh, have seen some opportunities and some uh, threats. Uh, by those advantages and uh, disadvantages we talked previously. Yeah. The idea is that when we apply the Web3 gaming, the Web3 concept to gaming, we essentially get the same advantages and the same disadvantages as the Web3 concept does, right? But also, we get new ones. We get increased UI complexity that kind of takes a hit into user adoption, for example. And a lot of other stuff, like true, true ownership can happen in games with this. We can also have play-to-earn models and interoperability, and being able to play with different assets in different games. And we can see there are a lot of opportunities here. So we're going to talk about how we can take advantage of those and maybe mitigate the disadvantages, right? These are our pillars, and we're going to start with the first one. So the first one uh, it's value. Uh, basically, on that one, uh, can I go? Uh, the idea is to create a deep and long-lasting value. Uh, so uh, basically, give the players something they really care about and uh, something that they want to take to the finish line. Um, 
To, to each pillar, uh, we, we make some guidelines uh, that uh, we follow step by step and uh, try to, to apply those to our uh, products. On the value one, the, the first thing first, it's to know your audience, uh, know what uh, those players you want to play your games um, expect from your game, what kind of values they, they follow, what kind of games they play, then build systems around those and uh, systems that can uh, go forward to those expectations. But uh, uh, pay some attention for uh, the, the systems that really bring value to your uh, core loop. A core loop of a game, it's uh, just basically the essence of the game, the, the circle of actions and interactions that the player um, add with your, uh, with your game. Then, just go deeper and deeper on those systems uh, and pay attention to still focus on uh, the answers of your, of your game and uh, bring value to it. Uh, these are some applications uh, that we, that we separate and uh, compile all that ones in uh, one example. Uh, the example for this pillar uh, it's Kyo. Kyo is one of our IPs in Red Cat Peak Studio. It's a multiplayer vehicle combat game, uh, multiplayer. It's not a web tree game oriented. It's uh, a traditional game, uh, let's call it. Uh, but it's very easy to apply the, the web tree technology uh, to it. Uh, for example, take those cars, uh, take those vehicles, turn them to distinct and dynamic NFTs, uh, and uh, give some systems, for example, durability to people care about, to turn the NFT something really meaningful, uh, customizations, so that way the, the player can express themselves uh, using the, the NFT. Or maybe some uh, history system to the asset, for example, recording the, the wins, the mileage, the, the kills with that vehicle, and that way uh, we guarantee some value to the NFT and uh, guarantee some legacy to it too. Uh, talking about legacy? Yep. We have the next pillar. So essentially here, the idea is to make a game that is enjoyable off-chain. A lot of times people tend to focus on games that are fun on the blockchain. They even start out with maybe a, some cryptocurrency or an NFT, but they tend to forget what's behind all of it. And the thing is, uh, if that crypto or that NFT goes bankrupt, the game falls, essentially, depending entirely on the well-being of that own NFT. We can have that, so we should make fun games, entertaining games. And to make that, we have this kind of outline. This is the biggest one, okay? Don't be scared. You won't be seeing anything like this ever again. But the idea is that, once again, you start with the experience. And this can be the one you started from or just the one that evolved. But you must always be aware of what it is, the experience that you're setting, right? Then you create a core loop, like we're talking about. And it, by itself, should portray the intended experience, right? If you don't have that, if the game is not fun just with the core loop, everything else will just be dressing into something that will not work out. After you have that, you can add your retention, you can add your complementary systems, everything contributing to that sole base experience. Meaning, in the end, you'll have a very concise and dense experience to deliver to players. Now, we also have flow graph. This is just talking about immersion. You must keep players immersed at all times. This is the state we mentioned when people are playing a game and they forget their surroundings. They keep being inside the game, and that's what we want. We can also develop a first-time user experience, and this will lead on to onboarding, which is a major challenge with the F3 games. It must also be carefully plotted out. But guys, always, always test your games at any stage. There's never a stage that is too early to test. If you have a bunch of stuff, it's harder to tell apart what's not working from what is. So if you start doing that from the start, you'll get the good bits every step of the way. Now, again, a lot of ways you can apply this. You can have friendly UI, you can have innovation, you can have a cool play progression. But we've kind of outlined this example here, and we took out Resident Evil 4, which cannot be seen right there. Big mistake. But in this game, you have this inventory system, which is quite unique. And you're able to well, move around stuff, and they have actual size. We could mask this as a wallet, guys. This could be a wallet. Web 2 players would be none the wiser. 
everybody would just interact with it as a normal game, no complexity added, and we can just try and convert players with a, hey, you know, this weapon you've been using, it's kind of got a lot of worth. You could just lend it to some player and get some money. And that way, if we add this stuff that it's in the best interest of the player, we can also get conversion. So we tend to have a bigger player base, a game that is not supported fully on the blockchain, and player conversion, which would obviously help the ecosystem. The third one is the elevation. Um, always remember, the game justifies the technology, not the technology justifies the, the game. Not all games need uh, blockchain technology, not all games are pliable to, to use blockchain technology. And here, the, the technology always should serve the, the game itself, not uh, create a game just to use the, the technology. This just makes sense, don't make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, you need to analyze your experience and then uh, separate the pros and the cons of the technology um, on your, uh, uh, applied to your experience. Uh, it's basically that. Uh, can you mm -hmm. pass? Uh, some applications, for example, uh, we we uh, take Bloodborne from uh, from software, and uh, we have conceptualized in our minds this kind of series, taking the dungeon exploration of the the Bloodborne, and maybe we can turn that experience as an NFT. An NFT doesn't need to be just an asset, uh, a skin or a, a, a gun or a sword, something like that, a character. We can turn experiences to NFTs. For example, on that game, we, we, we think about um, procedure, procedurally generate some dungeons with uh, different uh, distribution of enemies, uh, different levels, level, different uh, assets and resources that the, the player can farm and gain, uh, gain from uh, that level. And imagine if the players can, for example, sell that experience or land to other uh, person, or for example, if I need some specific asset, some specific resource, imagine if I just can buy or lend that experience and farm, farm, farm uh, for the time I, I want and then uh, just sell it again and, uh, and keep the, the market um, dynamic. Uh, we can also, for example, took that experience and bring to other games uh, and uh, maybe for a platformer 3D and use that dungeon for uh, a base for a map. For example, this is the kind of applications we see uh, that the technology really elevates our games. So for the last pillar, balance, this is all about the game's economy. And the idea is that we should balance it in a way that is harmless, desired, and maximized. What we mean by this is essentially what's outlined here on the guidelines. The first one is that the economic incentive must not harm those who choose not to interact with it. Right? Again, a lot of times we see games being made for Web3 with Web3 interaction, then they expect people to buy, but that will kind of harm your player base. So this is the first guideline we tend to follow here. Now, next one is in regards to the majority of community. We want their desires to be heard. You're making a game, again, for an audience, which should probably enjoy your game at the least, right? So it's very important that they're in on it. But Obviously, not if it hurts the first guideline. We also have a third one, and on that third one, we essentially talk about the maximization of the value of the economic units. Obviously, we want everything to be as valuable as it can, right? But it should not come at a cost of the desires of the community, neither of the ones that choose not to interact with the economy. A lot of ways we can do this, and some of them actually were implemented into Web2 games, Voting systems can help players uh, get what they want inside the game. We can also avoid pay-to-win scenarios. That's always some sort of critique online. Even if you're not making a Web3 game, like Web2 games then suffer from this. Um, in this case, we are using an example of a game we built. It's called Overshock, right, from Red Cat Pig. And in this game, we have a multiplayer drone combatant. And each drone is made up of drone parts. Now, 
neither one of those zonal parts are essentially better than the others. The thing is that they are different. They provide a different experience to players. And you can also get them by just playing. Now, we also have this concept of meta, and it can obviously change the whole background and why people change the games and buy certain parts. Uh, meaning, with the evolution of the game, we can get dynamic fluctuations on the market of which piece is more valuable gameplay-wise and also have that circulation going on and creating a more dynamic economy. Uh, one thing uh, to add to the, that last pillar, that it's very important to see time as an investment to mm -hmm. and uh, try to reward those players. Uh, by the end of the day, uh, we all want to, to have a good user base that uh, go to the, to the game <laughs> like every day and uh, spend time on it. So usually players that invest a lot of money don't spend a lot of time on the game because they don't need to grind to have uh, a certain asset. But the player who doesn't want to, to invest money, but want to have those assets that make that, uh, uh, their experience better with uh, that skin that express himself or that gameplay style. And if they grind to, to get those assets, we guarantee a user base that are playing our games. So mm -hmm. focus on it. Uh, we think it's a, a very important point to, to add to all this uh, blockchain uh, discussion. Yeah. And in the end, we just want you to create experiences that are valuable, entertaining, and are evaluated by the technology you're choosing to use, but also are balanced. And that is and all. That's it. Uh, hope you like it. And <laughs> feel free to, to uh, give us some questions. Wow. Good. Good. Feel less stressed about your... Yeah. I don't know. If, well, he's just here in front. Gee. A lot of pressure here. <laughs> His boss is around here, you know. So. <laughs> Final boss on our game. Ouch! <laughs> ouch! You should ask for uh, an, uh, a raise. A raise after this performance. Mm. No, 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 no! I'm getting you him in trouble. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, this gave you the opportunity for build up your questions and also your comments. Yeah, just right in front. If they are, I don't know where they are with the microphone, but I can lend you yours, mine in this case. <laughs> Yeah, hi. As far as I know, most blockchain games are on desktop only. I don't know if they're on mobile yet. Uh, and one of the problems is that all these blockchain games that have an in-game economy, trading of assets, NFTs, uh, they're not able to get around Apple and Google's 30% commission. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the future of blockchain gaming as far as mobile goes? Ooh, that's a trick question, especially for me as a game designer. I don't really feel as qualified to answer that personally. Do you have any opinion but, on that? Yeah, if we, I think, uh, in my opinion, if we try to um, to destroy that estimations about the blockchain, it's money, because we can uh, use the, the blockchain without any marketplace on our products. For example, if you use the, the blockchain uh, technology just to keep some data secure, you are uh, using the blockchain, you don't have money involved uh, used by the players, don't have that kind of bad things, bad connotations. Um, One of the advantages of using, especially we saw in the last three, four years, Axie Infinity and all of that, it was a whole play to game, uh, play to earn aspect of it, right? Yeah. Uh, and that was one of the premises that was not there in Web2 generally. And oh. one of the most problems, it's not the, the, that idea of the play to earn, because it's a very difficult vision for uh, people who are not uh, instructed about it, and uh, people are insecure with uh, new things, always in the history we, yeah. we saw that. But these games actually lack quality. They aren't fun, they aren't entertained. Because mm. right. I, I think if you are playing a game, if you spend some time on it, and this time it's a value because simply is it retained, and if you gain money with it, what's the problem here, right? What's the afraid of it? And yeah, we have that other side uh, uh, of not using the blockchain technology to, to gain money, but to secure ourselves, guarantee some privacy. Uh, it's non... It's, it's undeniable that our information today, it's uh, centralized 
uh, to a small group of people that uh, control the world, right? And uh, uh, who doesn't want to, to have uh, our information secured, and even in the game design, for example, right? Sure, thank you. <coughs> the big boss. <laughs> I'll send the draw. Uh, let's talk a bit about the elephant in the room, absent but here. Artificial intelligence. What's the threat for you as game designers and game developers for the future? As human game designers and human game developers. <laughs> okay, the first thing I'd say is as a human, I feel more qualified to create an experience for another human uh, than AI. It's not quite there yet, so I'd actually think this is a trick question. <laughs> I'm also thinking a lot about art and how that can affect, because this is technically art, and it can already create art, but what's the meaning behind it, right? If it's not a person doing it. Hmm, very controversial. Nice question. But I think the, the, the most important aspect here is the, the human aspect. Yeah. For example, if you want to, to make a game that has some value behind it, some message behind it, I don't believe for now that uh, um, in, <laughs> artificial technology can do that. And uh, the people feel it. The people feel when it's a human that do something. I really believe on that. Um, one thing that I found fascinating about, I think it was last year, Starbucks doing their royalty or um, loyalty scheme on, on Polygon, I think, or on, on a blockchain. Right. So um, any other coffee shop could come in, potentially, because it's all transparent, uh, who has which badge, etc. Let's say Costa Coffee could come in and say, all the people that have this and that Starbucks NFT, they come, uh, please come in, you get a 20% uh, 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 reward for buying your next uh, coffee here. So it creates this like cross-pollination or competition between, between uh, companies that can like directly market to, um, to, to customers, even of competitors, because it's all transparent on the blockchain. Similarly, I thought this would apply to uh, gaming studios um, in a way uh, removing the lock-in of their user base. If, let's say, Riot or a big gaming company like that were to um, uh, issue the skins of the characters that you buy on a blockchain, then a small gaming studio could come in and sort of offer all of the people that they know got this and that reward from Riot in their game as well and try to do like sort of marketing through that. Have you seen anything like that already happening in, in, in the gaming world or any big players embracing this that then smaller companies could sort of hop on and, and try to catch some user base of the bigger ones? Uh, can you you want to because I personally haven't. Uh, I personally haven't too, but uh, I think uh, that's about one thing because th this kind of um, interoperability, uh, using one asset from uh, one ecosystem in uh, other ecosystem, I think it's a, a tricky, a tricky idea, tricky concept, because um, not all ecosystems are prepared to to embrace other ecosystems. Uh, there are some design aspects behind it, right? And uh, the things need to um, to be like a puzzle, you know, and uh, and uh, make sense uh, to to embrace this uh, operability function, you know. Uh, there are uh, some ecosystems that doesn't make. For example. Um, if we have uh, a FIFA using uh, some players as an FT, how can I use the, um, the same assets of um, FIFA in a Pro Evolution Soccer game if the art style is different, it's the, the, um, the, the licensing, yeah, to, yeah, uh, licensing, and the, the, the implementation, this, uh, some companies have uh, different um, technologies that the others uh, different um, game engines, different methodologies. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, it's a, a good advantage from the the blockchain that kind of uh, interpolation. Because if um, imagine if uh, ecosystems falls, 
uh, a server dies, some game loses a uh, user base, and you have uh, NFTs on their ecosystem. Technically, you, use, uh, you, um, you lost their use, right? And it's fine, and yeah, my, my desire is to some, in some way use that NFTs in other place, but it's not easy, it's not that easy, yeah. and, make, and try to, to make some partnerships and um, use some methodologies to, to bring that uh, functions to the table and make it some easy for us developers to, to use it. Yeah, the most I've seen are three games from the same company, I think exchanging resources as NFTs. But that's the closest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> okay. For, for example, I, I the idea was just, just finishing. For, um, if you are uh, paying attention, uh, you remember that uh, Bloodborne kind of idea uh, to generate uh, levels and uh, maybe use it on other games. Uh, it's easy, as my Alex and as Alex said, uh, in the same company. I take my level from one of my games and use it in other game. But I know my methodologies, I know my, my technology, I know the way I work, and it's easier that way. What I was going for is less the question of interoperability between games, but more identifying a player base, for example. Uh -huh. Now, if, in the Starbucks case, yeah. You can identify, you, uh, Costa, of, obviously, they don't uh, issue uh, Starbucks coffee to the customers, but Costa coffee. But they can identify the most loyal, let's say, uh, Starbucks customers. They can say, hey, we offer you the special deal if you come over to Costa and play mm -hmm. with us. Similarly, if you have very engaged gamers that like, mm -hmm. enjoy one particular style of game, and you think I can actually drive those to come over to try my game, you can now target these people rather than like, taking over the skins and importing them to your game, you can, you can just uh, uh, sort of capture their user base because it's transparent on, on chain versus just yeah. an, you know, in, you, you know, a walled garden sort of environment. And that's the, the interesting like, cross-pollination no, aspect, it, I think. As Mauricio said, the big boss, it's a very, very clever uh, marketing idea. And if you somehow manage in a design aspect in an uh, implementation aspect, uh, make an ecosystem that uh, really links to the ecosystem you, you want to, to embrace the, and uh, bring that user base, yeah, I think you can uh, actually do that. Partnerships will uh, always make the things easy, right? But it's not always as we want. Yeah, the pressure is coming up. No, I'm not going to do any tricky question. I mean, you guys are almost dying over there, so I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. Not dying. Come on, a big applause for them. They're doing great. <laughs> Yay, we need to encourage. It's, it's, it's their right. boss. Their all boss, right. you know. All right, all right, all right. No, no races. No races. Um, no, I just want to comment with what uh, uh, Ro um, um, mentioned. Yeah, no, sorry. No, you, you, you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, about Apple Store and Google and all of that. I mean, to me, it's just a matter of time, man. I mean, for, for PC games, for example, all the stores were totally avoiding NFTs, and, 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 but it, only, it was just a matter of one big guy saying, all right, we'll accept it, like Epic did. So Epic already accepts NFTs and anything involved in crypto. Um, so now there is a big pressure towards um, Steam to make that available too. So it's just a matter of time. And same thing will happen with, 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 with the um, mobile platforms. Um, there is a lot of uh, Web3 games on mobile, but they are always dependent on their, I mean, la um, launch pads or, or, or I mean, uh, directly installed through websites. Um, and well, it, it, it creates a lot of, um, a lot of a hassle for the player, so it's not very common. But it's just a matter of time. They'll, they'll, they'll get there. I, I'm, I'm confident of that. And just look at the PC model. It was just a matter of time. Yeah. Talking about time for our last question. I'll get it for you, so be quick. Thank you. Thank uh, so I have not one question. Actually, it's one for you guys. Mm -hmm. and. Three answers for the other questions. 
Uh, the questions for you guys is um, how fun and how entertaining, entertaining is for you, specific mm -hmm. as a design background, game design background, to actually produce games for Web3? Mm. Okay, personally, I like a challenge. This isn't the first time we've kind of diverged from the traditional path, right? Uh, I can't speak about that stuff because I have an NDA and my boss here, but um, I do love trying to solve these riddles, you know? This UI complexity, how can we approach this Icony Mask stuff? And there's also the client element. They always have their own like goals, right? Their mission statement and so, the, uh, that stuff, which you must align. So personally, I enjoy that challenge. I enjoy trying to work with the new technology and do the research and also cater to what the client wants and what the user wants. For me, it's fun. And uh, to add to those ideas, uh, the, the opportunity to explore an area uh, so young and uh, with just a few references, not something that is solidified, I think, yeah, had a, a really good challenge to, to our um, creative process, for example. And uh, the not only the the challenge of creating the game but this contra this cons turn around all the the bad connotations that blockchain mm. can uh, can have right now and uh, try to to give you guys some new perspective uh, to to apply the blockchain to to the gaming but yeah uh, it's a, a really fun process <laughs> I, have the answers. I agree with that. <laughs>